So, a couple days ago at this point, I was, a lot of, there was, I was on a live stream with the Answers of Reason guys. And yeah, it was a six hour live stream. And then I, your humble apologist, showed up for a couple of those hours to basically destroy those guys. Annihilated them. They had no chance. The uh, Answers of Reason like, well, we don't believe in your God here, Craig. Philip, tries to, Philip says to me, I just like a belief in God. <laughs> and then the purple guy, what did the purple guy say? He tries to put one of these, got any evidence for your sky fairy, Craig? I said evidence, that's not evidence. So I destroyed that. And Notes from Autumn was there, destroyed her too. I had no choice in the matter. You know, I had to show up and do some slam dunk apologetics. I'm like, oh yeah, guys, Kalam. And they're like, Kalam, Kalam, what's that? Kalam. I'm like, Kalam, read the first premise. Everything that exists must have a cause. Like, a cause? What do you mean? Uncaused cause. There you go. Give me the ties, guys. Just like that. Cleaned it up. Cleaned up. Just like that. There you go. Game over. Give me the ties, guys. Give me the ties. That's pretty much how it went down, or at least, well, that's how I remember it. Um, that's not quite exactly how it went down. That's pretty much how I remember it. It's something like that. But what was interesting, actually, okay, so I made a video a couple weeks ago where I was speculating about the nature of the tension between Notes from Autumn and the ACA. And I got to talk to Autumn, you know, hear it straight from her mouth, and at least some of what I guess the tension was about is some of what the tension was about. There were two videos, I guess, that she was on with the line that got taken down where I'm still not clear what happened. Maybe there was a dust up on air. I don't, I don't know for a fact. But as she said, see, one of the things that I've been talking about a couple of times of late, the brand that the, of atheism that the atheist experience has put out there that is most closely associated with, and it is mostly Matt Dillahunty who has popularized that brand of atheism, is wrecked the theist. Here, theist is calling. Make them look and sound stu feel stupid. <laughs> there you go. We got a theist call on the phone. Good. Make them look, sound, and feel stupid, and then hang up on them. You jackass. Matt Dill has a whole protocol of like things he goes through where he like, you know, moves them to the Old Testament, moves them to uh, slavery in the Old Testament. You jackass. Oh my God. He'll say it at least three times. Oh my God. And then there's, there's even like. Apparently, I just found this out, but there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, delay for the person who's calling. And Matt Dillahunty, one of the things he always gets mad about is the person's always cutting him off, but that's never the person's fault. Why? Because there's a delay. So he's, and he's always like, oh my God. Um, now, the problem for the ACA is it's a very popular show, atheist-wise. I'm pretty sure it's the most popular thing going on in atheist land altogether on YouTube or Twitter. And probably the biggest selling point is Matt Dillahunty wrecking the theist. So that sort of brand has been associated with the atheist experience from the whole time. Um, that's what they do, you know. You call, the theist calls up and Matt Dillahunty tries to make you look and feel and sound stupid. And it's usually pretty successful at it, I gotta say. He does a pretty good job of it. <laughs> and what he does, I've, ex I've, I've analyzed the tactics, he plays the person you know, and he uses tactics rather than deals with the argument. Now, the problem with that brand of atheist, and I sensed that some of Notes from Autumn's tension between her and Matt Dilla Hunty had to do with her discomfort with that brand of atheism. And that's at least, she at least alluded to that in the conversation we had. I, I didn't wreck anybody. I, you know, I, I would have wrecked them. I would have laid down arguments on them, I, I, I felt a little bit just compelled to be a little more immersed. They were being civilized, so I figured, you know, I could hit them with the Kalam, and they won't know what to do. They'll go running for the hills. They won't know, they won't know how to handle it, but I'll, I'll, I'll let them be. I'll let them not believe in God for a day or two long. So I didn't actually destroy them. I was just exaggerating. Um, yeah, I was exaggerating a little. Um, so no, it was actually a really cool conversation. And one of the things that I got from Notes from Autumn discussed, we did discuss that situation with Matt Dillahunty. So it was interesting, I got a couple of different takes on it. And uh, one of the things that she said, which I totally agree with, and I, I sense that, that her and I were sort of on the same page, that I agreed with her in spirit, is that with great power comes great responsibility. Yes, yeah, she, quoted the, she quoted the Bible, swear to God, swear to God, I didn't prompt her to do it. Um, she did, she quoted the Bible. And what she meant in this context is like they're kind of the leading voice of atheism in the atheist community. 
the leading representation of what most people think of when they think of atheists on Twitter or YouTube. So they have some responsibility to represent the, the other voices in the community, the other types of atheists. And I totally agree with that. That's at least what I thought she meant. I'm pretty sure that's what she means. She didn't quite spell it out, but that's what I got from, what, from her comment. And I totally and 100% agree with that. Now, that's one of the things I've been saying the whole time. There's a tension between... These are basically the philosophical atheists that I was talking about. This is like one of the main crews. There are other types of philosophical atheists out there, but it's a totally different type of atheist. It's a totally different type of atheist experience, <laughs> ironically. I was on the show, I was on the channel with them, and like, you know, the, the, when, the problem with the Matt Dillahunty brand, there's a lot of problems with it. But one of the key problems with it, okay, is first of all, it requires stupid Christians. That's what it requires. Now, so once upon a time, that was really easy to do. Why? Because there were no really smart Christians in the space. I swear to God that's true. That's part of why this type of debate me bro style of atheism got so popular. Why? Because there was only a handful of Christian apologists, uh, most famously Venom Fang X, and this guy, Joshua Furstein, if you know any of those names, you know who I'm talking about, go look them up. I, I'm not sure if their videos are still around, but you'll see. <laughs> it's, you'll see why this, this Debate Me Bro style got so popular. Why? Because they had these, like, you know, these guys to totally manhandle. <laughs> these little chew toy Christians that they could just totally deal with, you know, for, and maybe, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, what's that? Not Deacon Verman. Who's the other guy? The guy Stephanie streams it every once in a while. Uh, I forget his name. Zero Man? No, that's not it. Apologies. Um, I don't know. There's another guy who was probably around in those days. I can't His name is escaping me right now. But part of what made that particular brand of atheism, why it had some success in the space, is that there were really dumb Christians to, to kick around. Now, I get sometimes why that would be popular. If you're a Christian, you know, you got to suck it up every once in a while. You'll see like a Kenneth Copeland. And you'll be like, uh oh. <laughs> you'll see, like, Kenneth Copeland trembling. And you'll be like, oh God, here we go. And you're like, what is this going to be? And it's some, like, really embarrassing thing. Like, you saw that one that everyone, you know, and, and the atheists are going to have a lot of fun at our expense. And you're going to kind of hide your head in your hands and, like, you know, pretend not to be a Christian for a couple of days. That's par for the course. You'd expect that to happen. You expect that to have some degree of popularity in atheist Christian relationships. The problem with the atheist experience is that that's, that becomes almost the entirety of what that show is about. Um, and they are aware of it to some degree, and they are aware of the fact that it isn't tenable for the long term. That's at least my guess, because they hired Shannon, they hired Jenna Belk, and they hired V, and all three of them are totally different. That's a totally different type of brand. Shannon will have a conversation with the person. I don't think I've ever seen her try to like wreck the theist. I couldn't even imagine how that would go down. But a key part of why the atheist experience is popular is that dynamic. That's what a lot of people are there to see. Matt Dillahunty manhandles some Christian and make him look and sound like an idiot. And Matt Dillahunty does it really well. And the problem for the atheist community in general is that particular style of atheism isn't tenable for the long term. Why? It requires stupid Christians. And if the Christian isn't stupid, then you have a, pro a problem, potential problem, because like, for example, Christian Idealism called the show. Um, most of the people listening to this video will know who Christian Idealism is. Not stupid by any long stretch of the imagination. Actually one of the sharper tools in the shed. You can go watch his debate with Ben Watkins. Um, he had a couple of long conversations with Jeffrey Williams, you know. Some ways he's, he's really sharp. And even Matt Dillahunty went out of his way to try to make him look stupid. He posted the video on his website. You can go watch. I'll, I'll have a link to it. You know, and he, he basically objected, rightfully so. Here he was calling up to, I forget what, he, what type of argument he was trying to lay down, but Matt Dillahunty even successfully made him look stupid. Now, if you make somebody look stupid who isn't stupid, that's not on them, that's on you. And that's not cool. And that's potentially a problem, and that's part of what Notes from Autumn was objecting to. If I'm a Christian and I call up, and I've actually got some halfway decent arguments... You know, the onus is on you to have enough integrity to let those arguments be heard. If you got comebacks, that's fine. But he, like, did this pulled, pulled stunts with 
did tactics with Christian idealism, made him, just tried to make him look and sound and feel stupid. And that's not a really good, that's not a really good look for the entire community. That's part of what her objection was, at least part of what her objection was. Then she also had some things about them being, a, a guess, a nonprofit. You know, that's not my thing. I don't know anything about that. And, but part of the objection and part of the objection with the philosophical atheists is that's not their brand of atheism. That's not what they do at all. For example, I was streaming with them the entire time as a Christian, and they didn't make me feel, they didn't even, you know, try to make me defend my faith at all, which I wouldn't necessarily expect them to. But um, their brand of atheism is tenable for the long term. It's basically, these are people who are really interested in philosophy of religion, they're honest actors, and, you know, they don't believe in God. There's no conflict there. There's no, they're, they're not contingent on anything that happens in the Christian community. They certainly aren't contingent on Christians being stupid, but they aren't necessarily contingent on any behavior from Christians at all. They can have their, their, do, have their conversations about what constitutes evidence and what constitutes good arguments, and that's the type of conversations they have when I wasn't there. And when I was there, you know, it, it, it didn't change the dynamic at all. They didn't spend any time trying to debunk, dismiss, or discredit me. Now, that's how I expected most atheists to act prior to me coming in the space four years or so ago when I first got here. There weren't as many apologists around. Now there's a lot. And a lot of the apologists who have come in the last two or three years are not stupid at all. That's why the, uh, the Debate Me Bro style of atheism, its days are numbered. Why? Because most of the Christians who have shown up in the last two or three years are, aren't dumb. They have actual solid arguments. You can object to the arguments and you can, uh, you can have a good conversation. You know, before I got on the, uh, on the show, they were talking about Thought Adventure podcast, the Muslims, who are actually really pretty grounded in the philosophical arguments. And, you know, it's basically a cautionary tale as to what happens to Debate Me, Stro Debate Me Bro style of atheism when they go meet someone who's actually prepared with the argument. Um, you know, even Matt Dillahunty would struggle with those guys a little. He may, he'd probably be able to handle them, but when you saw Aaron Ra on their show, they basically walked him through the logic of the contingency argument, and they more or less got him to sign off on necessary being until he realized what he was doing. It was like, oh, oh no, wait, 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 no, right. <laughs> and then he, but they spent about an hour and a half, it's like a case study in walking somebody through you know, the logical implications of a halfway decent argument for God. That's what happens to a debate me bro style of atheist when they're actually come up against people who are prepared philosophically. They look dumb. That's the point. The type of atheist that's debate me bro only succeeds in making Christians look really stupid if the Christians, you know, conveniently happen to be really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. It happens a lot, though, Craig. I understand that it happens. I understand it's not that hard to find, you know, not that intelligent Christian to kick around. And that's part of what made the show successful. But now as the show is starting to get more popular, there are other types of Christians who are calling up the show, and they can't be easily dismissed. If they are easily dismissed, like he did with Christian idealism, that's not, that, that should, that's not integrity. Why? Because Christian idealism actually had intelligent things to say. So he should have been heard and given a fair hearing. Now, Notes from Autumn doesn't want to participate in anything like that, nor do the, do the, guy, the Answers from Reason guys. That's what I'm saying. It's a total, they're a totally different type of thing. But what their, their type of atheism, the philosophical atheism, what I've been calling it, I might come up with a better name for what they represent in the future, has staying power. It's not contingent on any behavior from the Christian community. It's not contingent on anything happening in Christianity at all. They're basically, they're self-contained and they're, there's no contradictions in how they are. The debate bros have a, have a really big glaring contradiction in their behavior. Couple. First of all, as a general rule, they aren't the sharpest tools in the shed. If you don't believe me, they, go watch them square answers and reasons squaring off against them himself. Because I've seen him go, I've even joined in a couple of his threads where I've supported him. Why? Because he's been right. He's been right and he's been having, um, you know, a debate with members of his own community who just don't get it. And these are like the science this, science that guys. They're like science, science, science. Oh my God, I can't believe how awesome science is. And they don't understand how science works at all. 
They don't understand anything about science or the history of science. I swear to God this is true. That's where I jumped in. I, was, I jumped in to defend Answers from Reason. Why? Because it was 100% correct. He was basically saying that um, the guy was trying to argue one of these science this, science that guys, that, you know, the only type of evidence that counts as evidence is empiricism. You hear that a lot. Okay, that's just dense. That's not a, that's not a, a legitimate claim. That's just dense. That shows you don't really understand how science even works. You can go look up the history of science in the last 150 years. Basic, anything in physics, basically. But, for example, general relativity, considered one of the most important scientific breakthroughs of the last 150 years. General relativity, not once, one ounce, not one ounce, and this is generally the rule with theoretical physics altogether, not one ounce of empiricism went in to, for, to Einstein's formulating the theory of general relativity. Not one ounce, not one minute. Not one minute of empirical investigation went into it. It was all argumentation. So what, what Answers from Reason was trying to argue with members of his own squad. Now these guys need to eventually yield and listen to, to the philosophical atheists. Why? Because they're right. They're more intelligent than your average atheist, but they're also correct. They're paying closer attention to actually how argumentation works, and they're interested in philosophy of religion, and they're, they're basically paying close enough attention that they're actually getting things mostly right. So he, he was saying, yes, argumentation is, does count as evidence. And the guy was saying, no, it's just empiricism, just empiricism. Okay, that's just not true. General relativity, for example, was formulated almost entirely by thought experiments, mathematical axioms, and um, uh, inference. That's it. That's it. That's the entirety of general relativity. It was, you know, formulated almost completely in Einstein's brain through thought experiments, which is a form of argumentation, mathematical axioms, which are another form of non-empirical uh, non means. It wasn't until years later, usually, when you're talking about the theoretical physics, not until years later, that things get empirically investigated for at all. General relativity wasn't until two years later that they got some empirical evidence to back up, I think it was the bending of light or something like that. Uh, the basics of general relativity, space and time, and the curvature of space-time, and um, how gravity, it's the basics of how gravity, you know, how gravity works. Um, it is considered one of the biggest breakthroughs in science of the last 150 years. It's that and quantum mechanics. Those are the two big things that are considered the breakthroughs of the 20th century. But quantum mechanics had a little bit more to do with empirical investigation. General relativity had almost nothing to do with empirical investigation. Oftentimes when you're talking about theoretical physics, the, the, when, when it comes time to investigate, the cost of building something like a hated super collider is so gargantuan that they don't go investigating until they're almost pretty sure they're going to find what they're looking for. So empirical investigation doesn't usually enter into it till years after the fact. And even like Einstein versus Niels Bohr, which I've referenced in some of my other videos, this was an argument about the nature of quantum mechanics. Okay, they didn't do experiment to experiment. It's not like Einstein did an experiment, go see, and then Niels Bohr did another experiment, go, no, look, see? It was nothing to do with empiricism. It was all thought experiments. You know, the famous photon in the box experiment. I forget what the actual experiment was. But he was, Einstein was trying to argue that there was a mistake in quantum mechanics because of the indeterminate nature of quantum mechanics. Tripped Einstein out. That's where he got the famous, you know, God, zut, zut, play dice, this is the universe. Um, so he was arguing that there were hidden variables that explained some of the seemingly indeterminate nature of quantum mechanics. He eventually wound up losing the argument or yielding the territory to Niels Bohr. But they, it was a series of letters that they sent back and forth. No empirical investigations took place whatsoever. That's my point. So the guy who Answers the Reason was talking to, where he was saying arguments count as evidence, he was basically, his job was to teach that guy, and that guy was just saying stuff he knew nothing about. Now that's pretty common when these guys swear off with members of their own tribe in the atheist community. You find them, te they, they, they should be teaching these people, and the people who they're squaring off are generally, generally speaking, the debate me bros. The irony of the debate me bros isn't just that they tend to be really dumb.
Okay, Matt Dillahunty isn't dumb. He's borderline brilliant, if not actually brilliant. That's why he's gotten away with it for so long. Aaron Ra isn't dumb either, but Aaron Ra's take on religion can be really dumb. And he'll do the same thing. He did it with Aryuna. You know, Aryuna was, uh, was the Hindu guy who was on my channel, and one of the reasons I had him on my channel is I saw him on Aaron Ra, and I could tell by, by what he was saying to Aaron Ra that he did, definitely had something upstairs, something to offer. And sure enough, you know, I'm pretty sure it's a degree in philosophy. But Aaron Ra spent the whole hour and a half trying to make him look and feel and sound stupid. And the audience bought it, but I didn't. I was like, dude, this is just ridiculous. The audience bought it. I can't believe this stupid religious guy, this stupid Hindu is just as dumb as the Christians. You know, sometimes it's legit. Sometimes they get a Kenneth Copeland on an Aaron Ra show and he, and he manhandles them for like appropriate reasons. Why? Because the guy is a Nimrod. That's fair enough. And sometimes dumb Christians call it the atheist experience. And the early years, I'm sure, it was mostly stupid Christians. But you can't keep going when the Christians aren't stupid. Why? Because either you're being stupid, it's going to blow up in your face. It's just not tenable for the long term. Why? Because all of this takes place in public. Everybody can check your work. There's nothing being, there's no videos being made out here that aren't just in the privacy of your own home and you're not writing down Twitter tweets in the privacy of your own home. We can all check to see if you know what you're talking about. So the debate me bros are not long for the space. As I said, there's a lot of tension between them and the philosophical atheists. The only way it ends is in favor of the philosophical atheists. Now, just a little side note. Let me see if I'm running on time. So I had a lot of fun being on the channel. It was fun. It was cool. I like I liked those guys. I like hanging out with them. I'll go, I'll go there often. And there's a lot of stuff I want to ask them about because I think their perspective on this space is be really, really, really useful. Now, Notes from Autumn is, is starting to pal around with them, which is good. Because Notes from Autumn, if they get Shannon on their side, that's all I said. Shannon, Shannon is my first, my first person in line to become a full-blown philosophical atheist from the, like, more... Uh, what am I calling them? The content creators, the more established content creators. She's a kind of a big star in the atheist community. She, I fully expect her to become one of them very soon. She becomes one of them. Game over. They're going to be the most. They're they're going to be the most influential voice moving forward. Maybe not this particular guys. I mean, it could be these particular guys, but this particular style of atheism will stand the test of time. Why? Because there's no contradiction in it. The main contradiction of the debate me bros is that they are dogmatic ideologues. That's the part that really threw me when I first started doing apologetics. When I first started doing apologetics, I didn't know anything about apologetics. I just started a, a, my Twitter feed on a whim and uh, started my YouTube channel more or less the same way. I, I barely knew what apologetics was. I got up to speed relatively quickly, but the one thing that really threw me, I thought I was going to get along with atheists pretty well. Uh, generally speaking, in the real world, I get along with everybody. Trump, doesn't matter. Any, any group of people, I can go become one of them just like that. So I thought I was going to get along with atheists really well. Why? Because I thought we had some stuff in common. As a general rule, atheists are a little bit more open-minded and thoughtful than your average Joe. And they are smarter than their average Joe. That is, does have a lot to do with why they deconverted originally. They're more inqu inquisitive. You know, there are certain types of people who sit in the church and don't want to question. That's a type of person. They don't want to ask questions. They just want to do their thing and be left alone and be at peace with it, which is fine if that's the type of person you are. The atheists tend to be a different type of person, more philosophical in nature, as a general rule. So I thought I'd get along with them really well. That's the way me and my sister are. We get, get us together, we can talk. <laughs> I don't want to say BS. We can BS for four straight hours. But, but you know, that's basically what we're doing. Um, atheists is the same way. Or, I, uh, I, I, my guess was they were the same way. What I was shocked to find was this sort of debate me bro wrecked the Christian culture. I gave, it blew my mind. When the first time I was on an atheist stream, the guy was just trying to shut me down, make me sound stupid, make me look. I blew my mind. I was like, what on earth is going on here? This is really bizarre. Then I got used to it after about a year and a half, and I got used to the fact that there's a lot of atheists who are like that. Now, not all atheists are like that. That's the point. Every atheist who's been on my channel has at least a core of integrity or a core of decency and civility or if I wouldn't have had them on my channel. There's no reason they would have been there, including Autumn. That's why she was there, because I'd seen her interact. It was like, okay, she seems smart, she seems honest. Let me ask her if she wants to be interviewed. 
and then I destroyed her. <laughs> and I destroyed her. That's how it goes, you know. You run my channel down, suck up. <laughs> and I'm then I ate her for breakfast. No, I didn't. I just asked her questions. Someone, someone, someone's gonna go like, see, see, Craig, that's what you just asked her questions about her deconversion. Apparently, it was deconversion light. If you want the real story of her deconversion, go check her out on Neil's channel. That's that's what she told me. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't see her. I'll check that out at some point. So the part that really threw me when I was dealing with actual atheists in the space was like, wait a minute, there's a whole contingency of these guys, I'd say 30%, who are dogmatic ideologues. Those are the ones who always square off against the philosophical atheists. Now, if you think about that, that's really deeply ironic. Really deeply ironic. Why? Because a huge chunk of the reason why they would have deconverted from their religion, whatever religion they were, usually fundamentals, Christianity, is because fund they'll tell you straight out of their own mouth. Because, you know, religious people are too dogmatic and ideological. Okay, well then, if you become the same way as an atheist, you don't find that ironic at all? <laughs> There's no problem there? You, that doesn't bother you at all? No, no problem there. No contradiction there, Craig. <laughs> That's the point. It's like, what on earth are you doing? So I figured there'd be a lot of people like the philosophical atheists. There are some. And they ultimately are going to win. There's a tension, like I said, there's a tension between them and the Debate Me Bros. The reason why the Debate Me Bros have been so successful and have come to somewhat define atheism, which is what Notes from Autumn was complaining about, because atheist experiences come to be most people's defining perception of what an atheist is. And that's not a good thing if you're an atheist. You don't want that. So you had atheists like... Uh, Godless Mom and Shannon in particular, I know for a fact they've said this because I've heard them say it. They want to normalize atheism. Okay, that's their role here. That's what they want. That's what they're doing. So that if you're working in a real job and you're working with like Joe the Atheist and saying you're like, who's going to be on the schedule for tonight? And someone says, you're going to be working with Joe the Atheist. They don't want me to go, ew, that baby eating freakazoid? That guy has no morals. <laughs> right there. You're going to have send me, make me work with that baby eating freak? That guy has no morals. They don't want me to do that. They want me to go, oh, cool, Joe the Atheist. I like that guy. He's smart. They want to give atheists a positive, you know, a positive look for the entire world to see. That's why the tension started to grow, because atheist experience started to grow in popularity, and it starts to represent a lot of people's mind what an atheist is. Now, that sort of brand of atheism has an appeal to a certain type of debate me bro clown. Why? Because that's what they show up here to do. I want to debate someone. I want to make them feel dumb. Can't wait to be like Matt Dillard. Shut you down, debate. Arr. Now, part of the other thing that popularized that type of atheism is Twitter itself. That's something I'm going to talk about in months to come because I think that's a lot more important to the story than people realize. The one thing that really shocked me, or didn't shock me, but I found very, very interesting and noteworthy. When I went back to New York, now keep in mind, where I'm from in New York is Westchester County, and most of the people I know are secular, secular nons, left-wing liberals. If anybody you'd expect to become atheist, it would be the, where I come from. If, you, if there were any storefronts of atheism in the real world where there's like, here's an atheist, you know, chapter or atheist store or an atheist community center, it would be where I come from, and there aren't there. That really threw me. There's only one place where atheism, or two, a handful of places in the country, where atheism has made any real world, like Austin, basically, and maybe Portland, maybe a couple other places. But other than that, atheism exists online, somewhat thriving online, you know, on Twitter and YouTube, but in the real world it hasn't penetrated at all yet. At all. Which threw me. Tells me that it's something I suspected, but, to, but I'm going to go into in videos to come. Is there's a real big disconnect between Twitter and what's still going on in the real world. Like, there's a lot of stuff that I was telling my sister about that she doesn't even know is, is happening. Things going on with trans, trans wars and trans activist type stuff. She didn't know, even know it was happening. And she follows the news pretty closely, which tells me that, you know, what we, what we participate in hasn't really penetrated the real world yet. So that's something I'm going to talk about a lot in videos to come. And hopefully I'll get to some of these guys on my channel, uh, particularly the purple guy and Answers from Reason and Philip, or I'll go back on there and get their, their two cents on the subject because um, I'd be interested in what they have to say about it. But so, anyways, uh, rambling a little, the long and the short of it is it was a pretty cool conversation after all. 
I could have wrecked them. I could have destroyed them. I decided it would be better not to destroy them and save it for another time when more people are watching. Then I'll destroy them. Then I will destroy them, yes. But at this time, I, you know, I held back. I held back my big guns. You know, I had the Kalam in my back pocket ready to slam it down and just see, watch them all run for cover. But I decided to keep it. <laughs> um, I actually don't really think the Kalam is all that great of an argument, by the way. It's one of my least favorite arguments, so I'm being fishy. It's entirely not even, I'm not even like, I'm not half kidding. I'm being entirely facetious, just entirely kidding. Just so you know, I don't think the Kalam is all that great of an argument. Um, so, that's the long and the short of it. The, the goal of somebody like Shannon and Godless Mom is to make atheists, normalize atheism. Okay, that goal is not consistent with the type of atheist, the debate me bro culture that atheist experience has been incubated. That culture is toxic to a large degree. That culture is toxic to even other atheists. That's part of what Autumn was objecting to, too. She didn't bring it up today in the stream where I was with those guys, but she's mentioned in the past. She's, it manifests, as far as she's concerned, is like, I guess, you know, people belittling her because she's a woman. But I think it's also, the baby bro culture tends to be toxic in general. And it does tend to be like manly man, like, bruh, yeah, bruh. you know, Matt Dillahunty is a big, beefy, burly guy. Did you ever notice that? He is. So is Aaron Ra. And sometimes they actually play into that fact. Particularly Aaron Ra. Now, doesn't affect me, why? Because they're not, they're not tough guys where I come from. They're not even close. They're, 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 nobody in the Bronx would ever mistake Aaron Ra for a tough guy. Nobody would even come close. He'd be terrified from some of the neighborhoods I've been to. He'd be terrified, literally terrified. But that does play into it. So she's right about that to some degree. There is some sort of like manly man. Ah. Brah, you know, <laughs> that's a part of it. I swear to God, that's a part of what's going on. That's part of why Stephanie was getting it so hard. Some of it was that Stephanie was a she. I swear to God, that's true. I swear to God, that's true. That's a part of it, for sure. It's not the whole thing, but it's definitely there. So, anyways, you know, I'm going to have... What I, what, I, what I predict is I'll have a good, fruitful time with these guys. I'll go on the show a lot and maybe have them on my channel once in a while. Um, just hide all the babies so they don't eat them. Uh, but as I said, my prediction overall for the atheist community, their brand of atheism is the one that's going to survive. Why? Because the, the, the dichotomies are too intense for the debate and grow culture. There's too many dichotomies. First of all, they're rabid ideologues. That's too ironic. Importantly, a lot of them are idiots. That's ironic too. As I said, you know, I've hung out with a lot of different types of people in the real world. For example, metalheads. Not the sharpest tools in the shed. But when you're hanging out with metalheads, they don't go, by the way, we're really great critical thinkers and we love science. You'd be like, what? It'd be the laughing stock of the entire community. Okay, that's what we got going on with some of the debate me bro clowns in the atheist community. They are actually meatheads. They're actually idiots. But they'll, they'll pin them, you know, they'll tell you with a straight face that they're great critical thinkers and they're really like in love with science. And as I pointed out, they don't generally know anything about how science works at all. So the only way this ends, the only way I see this foresee, foresee this ending is in favor of the philosophical atheists. Once they get a, a few more subscribers, once their brand gets popularized and people start to associate that with atheism, and then other atheists come into the space and start to see the benefits of that, because those benefits will accrue. There's no downside to being the type of atheist that they are. It's like Graham Oppie. I, I compared them to Graham Oppie. Graham Oppie, if you do not know, he's a well-known philosophical atheist, you know, philosophy professor, goes on debates all the time with these really highbrow debates, often on capturing Christianity. I have never heard anybody have a bad word to say about him. He is respected round the boards by Christian, Jew, and miscellaneous. So it, would, it is in the interest of the atheist community. If you're an atheist listening to me, it is in your best interest to have a smaller community that everybody respects than this big, unwieldy community that a lot of people hate. And a lot of people hate that the baby grows. That's the point. That's why it's not tenable for the long term. That's why it's making some people uncomfortable, even at the atheist experience. Because as the show grows in popularity, that's a good thing only if it's bringing you a good name to the atheist community. 
if it's putting a name and an association out there in people's minds with something positive that you want to associate with the atheist community. That's the only time that this popularity serves. Other than that, the popularity might start to become kind of a downside. So, yeah, I admit, it was a little rambly, Craig. <laughs> not, not your best work. I understand that. It just, you know, just had to mouth off on where I was at hanging out with those guys. So, I had a fun time with those guys, and I like them. And as I say, their particular style of atheism is the, is the style of atheism that is going to succeed for the long term. I think that a lot of, a lot of the success of the debate me bros is temporary and it's contingent on Matt Dillahunty because of how big of an influence he was and Christopher Hitchens. Those are the two that popularized that style of atheism. There's nobody else coming down the pike who can do what he does. There's nobody else coming who's a debate me bro. So once, once his influence is gone, the, there's no more of that type of atheism around. Now, Twitter has helped to incubate that style of atheism because Twitter is all about debates. You know, Twitter's debates. That's what Twitter is. It, 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 it has a tendency to escalate tribal conflicts and escalate. It's, it's what it's about. So that's affecting things, too. And I, I'm going to analyze that with some degree in depth in the future because I think that's a lot more important part of the story than people realize. In the general culture at large, too, I think Twitter is really, really, really having a big influence that people just don't notice as much as it actually is. So, anyways, I'll go that into that, though, in videos to come. So, that is all for now, kids. Uh, go watch the six hours, you know, you can watch six hours if you want to, or you can just fast forward to the parts where I come in and basically destroy them. Um, it's cool. It's a fun conversation, and I'm sure there will be many more, many more fun such conversations to come. There's a lot of things that I want their opinion on because I'm very curious about. Uh, so there you have it, kids. That is all for now. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.